Welcome back. I'm so honored I got a chance to sit down with Matt Ridley. He's a best-selling science writer, a researcher, and an English Viscount. Just Google it, because I had to. I'm a huge fan of his work, especially his books, The Rational Optimist and The Evolution of Everything. His classic TED Talk, When Ideas Have Sex, is a must watch. Matt's had an enormous influence on my perspective, and he's the first person I turn to for inspiration when things seem especially dark and depressing in the world, which makes now the perfect time to share his message. My name is Matt Ridley. I'm a rational optimist about the world. I think the world's gonna go on getting better, and I reached that conclusion by looking at real facts about the world and not letting my prejudices get in the way. Just the facts, ma'am. We are being bombarded by fear-based stories of apocalypse. The New Republic has a whole section of its website titled Apocalypse Soon. A recent article series in the New York Times titled Postcards from a World on Fire with headlines like Cities Swallowed by Dust, Human History Drowned by the Sea, and Economies Devastated, Lives Ruined. Is it any wonder that a recent landmark survey of over 10,000 16 to 25 year olds from around the world found that eco-anxiety was negatively impacting their daily lives? Cut down trees. I'm gonna try to fight them off. I hate them. But that's not all. The fear industrial complex would have us believe that the world isn't just on fire, but it's getting poorer, hungrier, more dangerous, and more unequal. Every generation thinks that it stands at a turning point. Things have been getting better and better, but they're about to start getting worse. I call it turning point-itis. Matt Ridley's decades of research and writing challenge these everyday assumptions about the world, human motivation, and the trajectory of the human experience on this planet. We had a wide-ranging conversation that we'll link to at the end of this video. I think you'll get a lot out of it, so please check it out. And while you're at it, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell on this video. It'll help us grow a community of dads who want to save America together. But first, here's the top five reasons to be a rational optimist, according to Matt Ridley and reality. Number five, we aren't starving to death. We've been hearing it repeated for centuries. We're all going to run out of food. In a 1969 essay titled Eco-Catastrophe, renowned biologist and frequent Tonight Show guest Paul Ehrlich predicted food shortages and famine would plague humanity by 1975. Well, we're losing 10 to 20 million people a year to starvation right now. That's a big disaster already. We are very close to a famine disaster in the United States because of the things that air pollution is doing to change the weather. Famine is mass death as a result of starvation in one part of the world, and it used to be very common. We are the world. We are the children. It happened in Asia, it happened in Africa, it happened in many parts of the world for years and years and years. It hardly ever happens now. There are still people who are hungry in the world, but mass starvation as a result of food shortages have stopped happening. Please, sir, I want some more. In the 70s, people thought famine was gonna get worse and worse. It didn't, it pretty well died out. And by now, it's frankly in a position where we can call famine extinct. It's just not happening anymore around the world. In an NPR report based on UN global statistics, hunger has declined in absolute terms by 200 million people since 1990. And that's despite the population of Earth growing by over 2 billion in the same time frame. How is this possible? And why do so few people know about this miracle? Could it be that the good news just doesn't bleed enough to lead? Number four, we aren't going to run out of resources. This fallacy dates back at least 200 years with the writings of English economist and demographer Thomas Malthus. This is why we call this kind of doomsaying Malthusian. As far back as 1909, there was a belief that petroleum would run out by the 1940s, or the rainforests would be gone by 2005. And don't forget the perpetual fear of a water crisis. This Malthusian mindset is perfectly captured by a viral video titled The Story of Stuff, which has been used in our schools for over a decade. Its friendly style makes it a perfect tool for terrifying our kids. The truth is, it's a system in crisis, and you cannot run a linear system on a finite planet indefinitely. The popular belief is that resources are going to run out, that there's only so much growth you can have on a finite planet. But that doesn't take into account the fact that some of the growth we achieve is actually shrinkage in terms of the amount of resources we need to, to do things. We make things smaller, we use less material in them, or we use less land to produce 
produce a given amount of food, 68% less land to produce the same amount of food as we would have needed 50 years ago. If we go on doing that, we'll feed the world from a few buildings somewhere and the rest can be returned to nature. That's an example of using less resources. So barring some extraordinary astrophysical event, I think there's no way that humanity is gonna go extinct in the next decade. All the evidence suggests that people are actually going to be more numerous and better off in a decade than they are now. Case in point, according to the work of MIT scientist Andrew McAfee, the American economy is now using fewer physical resources in absolute terms, even as we continue to grow. We really are doing more with less. Think of how many objects are replaced by this iPhone. It's a Walkman and every tape and disc ever recorded. It's a computer minus the floppy disks. And it's a 4K video camera and complete recording studio. This is truly amazing. A portable television studio. Perhaps the most profound insight about resources is that there is no fixed pool of them. The gasoline in most cars wasn't even considered a resource at all in the early days of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil. Gas was considered a useless byproduct of the production of kerosene, which was used in lamps. Rockefeller targets a byproduct of refining oil that for years has been thrown away. The toxic substance is called gasoline. And so far, no one has figured out a use for it. Think about that. Gasoline wasn't even a resource a hundred years ago. It was waste. Today, it's liquid gold. We can only imagine which of today's trash will be tomorrow's treasure. Number three, the poor aren't getting poorer. If you ask people if they think the global poor have gotten poorer, the majority will say yes, they have. According to national polling data, at least two thirds of Americans believe that poverty has gotten worse over the past three decades. This is yet another negative thing that people know that just ain't so. Most people think that the percentage of the world living in extreme poverty is going up. It's not, it's going down. It's going down at an unprecedented rate. Less than 10% of the world now lives in extreme poverty. When I was born, more than 50% of the world lived like that. Nobody has ever lived through a transformation as spectacular as that. The extraordinary decline of poverty over the last 50 years is basically the result of innovation. Innovation in technologies that help people, innovation in medicines, innovation in healthcare, but also innovations in how people live their lives, in how they run their organizations and institutions. It's innovating ways of doing things better that makes us better off. India was once renowned for its grinding poverty. My generation grew up with Mother Teresa in Calcutta seared into our minds. Many so-called experts thought progress in that country was impossible, or worse, that it was baked into Hindu culture. Yet since India opened its economy in the 1990s, hundreds of millions of people have lifted themselves out of poverty. The same is happening in Africa today, where you'll find some of the fastest growth rates on the planet. That's something we should all be celebrating, and it's especially important for our next point. Number two, climate change won't wipe out humanity. Look, I realize this is the hot button topic of our times. It is the climate crisis. What I'm saying is the planet's on fire. Here's the problem. All the overheated rhetoric about extinction and humanity's pending doom simply isn't reflective of the actual mainstream science. Yet 44% of Americans polled in a recent survey believe that regardless of our actions, Earth is doomed to become uninhabitable. Is our climate being impacted by human activity? Yes, of course. Is that process going to kill us all? No, no it's not. A 16-year-old today has a fantastic opportunity to live a wonderful life it's not a given that everything's going to go fine, things will go wrong, but the opportunities for living healthier, wealthier and happier lives in the decades to come are enormous. And that is true even if climate change gets a little bit worse. The evidence that people are going to go extinct or die of famine as a result of climate change in the next few decades is simply non-existent. None of the sensible projections from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change say that at all. Satellite evidence and several other lines of evidence suggest that the world is actually getting greener. It's got greener by about 14% in over 30 years. That's partly because of carbon dioxide in the air and partly because of reforestation. There's a ton of real problems with our public discourse around climate change being so hyperbolic. First of all, it sucks all the oxygen out of the room for discussion of other global issues that are arguably more pressing, like the tragedy of the commons in our oceans. 
Second, the disconnect between our fear-based rhetoric and the actual underlying data breeds distrust and nihilism. Life is pointless and nothing matters and I'm always tired. But worst of all, we're harming the mental health and mindsets of our kids. A survey of 2,000 Americans found that 78% of so-called Gen Zers, my son's generation, aren't planning or don't want to have children of their own due to their perceptions about climate change. This matters a lot to those of us that want to be grandfathers someday. The real climate crisis we face today isn't environmental at all. It's psychological. And as dads, we should work to guard our kids against this kind of catastrophic thinking. Knowing the facts and talking about them with your kids is a really good place to start. Join the conversation in the comments below. How can we help our kids be less afraid of these issues? Finally, number one, the world is less violent. The news is filled with story after story of war, terrorism, and school shootings. But in reality, these events are increasingly rare and taking fewer and fewer lives. Since World War II, deaths in state-based conflicts, aka war, have declined dramatically. Just in the last 20 years, being the victim of a shooting at a school, while already extremely unlikely, has become three and a half times less likely. Surprising, right? By some estimates, the risks of dying in a school shooting is one in 614 million. Obviously, one school shooting is too many. But the facts are clear. Your kids are in much more danger sitting in the back seat driving to school than sitting in their classroom. Despite what people think, violence is on the decline in all forms and pretty well everywhere. Not quite everywhere, of course, because there are societies where violence gets worse for various periods. But the amount of warfare in the world has gone down. The number of people killed in warfare has gone down. The number of homicides is going down in almost every society. The number of violent crimes of other kinds is also going down. The amount of cruelty to animals is going down. So whatever kind of violence you think about, it's on the retreat in humankind most of the time and in most places. So after hearing all these surprisingly positive facts about the world, you might be thinking, okay, so things aren't as bad as I thought, but better to be safe than sorry, right? That's the precautionary principle. Let's let fear motivate us to be better and be even safer. Here's the problem. We're not merely overprotecting our kids in response to all this fear. We're actively harming them in the process. For example, studies have found that active shooter drills in schools actively traumatize our kids while failing to meaningfully prepare them for an event that's less likely than a lightning strike. Telling our kids they have no future isn't motivating them to change. It's simply making them even more depressed and risk averse while obsessing over their unlikely extinction. And no wonder you're extinct. If you look at the history of innovation, it's not driven by worried, pessimistic people. It's driven by ambitious, optimistic people. Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos or Thomas Edison or Edward Jenner, the inventor of the vaccine, they weren't saying, oh my God, the world's coming to an end, I better invent something. They were saying, you know what, I could go out and invent something and, and maybe get rich along the way and maybe, you know, give humanity a good new technology. At the end of the day, the reason life can keep getting better in so many ways on this finite planet is because human ingenuity is infinite. As Julian Simon, the rational optimist of my dad's generation, famously said, the human mind is the ultimate resource. So we should do everything we can to support the curiosity and creative development of our kids and the systems in our world that empower that creativity to thrive. It's time to land our parenting helicopters and decommission those snow plows because they're fueled by fear and fear won't help our kids succeed. Thanks for sticking around and staying positive. Be sure to check out our full conversation with Matt Ridley where we dive deeper into all this and much more. And if you want to help us build the most optimistic community of dads on the internet, head over to dadsavetheamerica.com and donate to our cause. We're a nonprofit dedicated to celebrating American freedom and the potential it unlocks in each of us. 